We're recording. Oh, um, one last thing. Could you bring Amy in from the... Uh, I've been trying. She has to push a button to accept my invitation to come in as a panelist. So okay. I've, I've sent that prompt now three times. She's on okay. the phone right now. She may to be a little late. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, she may miss the show. Um, so I'm going to call the uh, Finance Committee meeting of May 19th to order at 1 p.m. And uh, I want to note that uh, this meeting is being held by Zoom as we are allowed to continue to do because of recent legislative changes. Uh, members of the public have access to the meeting via Zoom. And uh, just want to remind everybody, as usual, that the meeting is being recorded. And um, so with that, let me just go through the members of the committee to make sure everybody can um, hear and be heard. Um, start with uh, Anna Devlin Gauthier. Present. Uh, Lynn Griesmer. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. Matt Holloway. Present. Bernie Kubiak. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. And I'm here, and I think that Alicia is not here. Um, do you want to check on? Um, I've already sent her a text. And uh, others from the council who are present, I think we do not yet constitute a quorum for the council, but I see Jennifer Taub. You can hear, I assume. Um, Dorothy Pam. Mm -hmm. Can you, but can you acknowledge Dorothy? Yes. Okay. I'm. I'm. I can hear you. I yeah, have to. I, I think I'm there's, no, to there's no one else from the council who's not on the committee who's present. So um, we can proceed. And there was a request that we begin with uh, the uh, council order F Y. 2410 to establish the water and sewer rates to be effective July 1, 2023. This was in the packet for the prior meeting and it's been in the packet for previous meetings. Uh, we had uh, information and presentation on water rates and uh, I don't think that anything has changed and we had the presentation about the enterprise funds with and the enterprise funds budget at our last meeting and that um, was the same information that coincided. So I just want to see if there are any other questions about the water sewer rate proposal. And if not, um, then I'll make a motion. Andy, um, this is maybe a question for Athena. Is Athena still here? Did she hopped off. Looks like she hopped off. Um, so I can pull the order up if anybody wants to see it. I am noticing one little typo in the in the order, and it's related to the date of the memo, which I don't think is super important, but it's probably worth getting uh, updating that. Um, do you want me to share it real quick so you guys can see what I'm talking sure. about? Sure, since you may under that circumstance. Yeah, so it says effective July 1st, that's all correct, as recommended by the town manager and his memorandum to the town council dated May 2nd, 2023. Um, I think I've got the memo here. This is the memo, so I think it should have said dated April 28th, 2023. Um, again, a minor change, but um, for accuracy's sake. So I'm going to treat it as amended and make a motion that the Finance Committee recommend to the town council approval of council order 2410 in order setting the water and sewer rates to be effective July 1, 2023 as amended. Is there a second? Second. So is there any further questions or discussion regarding the motion that's on the floor? Since there's nothing, the vote is by members of the Finance Committee, of course, this is uh, 
other counselors will have the opportunity to consider this uh, at our next meeting. So because this is a recommendation being made for the first June meeting, which is our next meeting. Um, so let me just go through and ask for a vote. Um, Anna? Aye. Uh, Lynn? Aye. Please note that Alicia has joined us. Okay. Uh, let me pause for a moment. Alicia, hi. Can you hear? Hi, Andy. Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. So the motion on the floor uh, has to do with water and sewer rates, which we discussed in previous meetings, but couldn't take up at the last meeting because it hadn't been placed on the agenda, it is on the agenda for this meeting. So the motion, and there was one slight amendment to the order uh, just before you got on, you may have uh, not heard it, therefore, um, there was a um, just a date um, mistake as far as the date of uh, uh, memorandum that was referenced in it. So your the motion was that the Finance Committee uh, approve um, and recommend to the Council adoption of Council Order 2410, order of setting the water and sewer rates to be effective July 1, 2023, as amended. And the amendment is the correction of the date. So we've just started voting on that, just inside so just wanted to bring you up to date. So uh, we had uh, two votes started in the uh, cycle. And Anna and Lynn said yes. Uh, so Bob, I support. Okay, Matt, support. Bernie, support. Kathy, yes. I'm a yes. And um, Alicia, yes. Okay, so uh, motion is uh, five to zero for council members voting and uh, support from three resident members. And with that, uh, I'm going back to Sean, who's managing the order in which uh, we're taking up sections of the budget. Um, General Fund, I believe, Jen is first. Yes. Yep. So the, um, the first department today is the town council. Um, so there were some questions sent in by uh, Bernie and by Kathy around that. So I'll just read them and then Lynn or some of me, Paul, you want to hop in? Uh, let's see. So the first question, Lynn, this is nice. I get to ask you questions. This is like a role reversal. It's nice. Um, are there ways for the town council to be more, and remember, I am not asking these questions, so however you perceive these questions, not me. Uh, <laughs> are there ways for the town council to be more efficient in terms of use of staff time um, uh, based on you know the, the department heads and how much time they spend on council-related activities? There definitely are. This is something Kathy and others have discussed and GOL is actually looking at rules of procedure. It specifically relates to how fast do we refer somebody, something, a bylaw, for example, a zoning bylaw out for actual review versus send it first to a committee to look at. Uh, there's other ways to look at and then come back to the council af after it's been reviewed and in many cases modified. Right? An example of that is uh, where we are doing that is the um, street lighting bylaw, which was referred to TSO, and it still has not come back to the council, but it has never gone out for any kind of zoning review, and not clear that it will. But um, the example that I think people are more concerned about was the fact that we immediately referred the duplex triplex um, bylaw for a hearing to CRC and to um, GO, I mean, and to uh, the planning board without um, having a much more in depth conversation at the committee level, which might have changed some of what was there. Whether it still would have prevented um, staff time is unclear. Um, and I do note staff time that the council uses is not budgeted in the uh, town council's budget, it's budgeted in the department budgets, but it is something that. 
um, I'm more than willing to discuss with the town manager as to how much we track it. Uh, and I also invite people to submit as Andy has um, language for our rules of procedure um, that would change some of that process. Um, sorry for, about my voice, but it's my allergies. Um, so Kathy, you may want to say more, um, but that's, um, I think there's ways to account for it. And I think there's ways to reduce it. And some of it is by agreeing to priorities and agreeing to process. Thank you. I don't, so if people have follow up questions or any additional questions, just raise your hand and Andy or I will call on you. Um, yeah, the only thing that I was going to add is that uh, I've been thinking about uh, raising essentially the same issue when we talked with um, um, conservation and development sections regarding the effect, uh, the amount of time that is being uh, required because of uh, some of the uh, work that the council has done and just to get a sense from them on the same question. Right. Andy, you your I, hand I actually I actually want to note that I need to call the town council to order. Uh, for, for the record, it should actually show probably about 110. And I just need to make sure that I believe we've already called on everybody. Um, so and then Dorothy has her hand up. Yes. Uh... And I did call on Dorothy. And Dorothy, go ahead. Um, on this topic, um, I, I, Anna could correct me on this one. Um, when we did the water and sewer, um, we had an organized process. We would discuss an, an area and then we would vote on it. Um, I'm finding the um, duplex, triplex, and the, the big zoning thing to be so unwieldy that um, it's not even clear what's happening. No votes have been taken. It's huge and it's going to be voted up or down. I think that it's really not a good way to go. And using the water and sewer rates, uh, some of us on TSO were very clear that we wanted the town to cover um, the cost of replacing pipes at this point. It did not win in terms of the vote. And so we were able to, what we passed on, what, what ended up happening was part of that was done. And it seemed to be, you know, neat and rational. One could follow it. OK, whereas right now, I don't think anyone can follow what's happening and it's taking tremendous amount of time from the staff. And, um, you know, it's not really up to the staff to say, hey, we should they have suggested that it could be referred to the planning staff, uh, which I think is a good suggestion, because right now it's just like, you know, I was just needing some bread. You know, if you have too big a piece of dough, it just sags all over the place. You can't get control of it. You can't shape it. You can't make a loaf. And I, I think the process we've been doing on the zoning is really wasteful of everybody's time um, and will not result with what we want, um, which is an understanding of, yes, we're for this, but we're not for that, you know, but the whereas we were able to do that with the water and sewer. So that's my my thoughts on that. And, and uh, Dorothy, just to further that, if it had been referred just to CRC to do a review and then come back to the council with whatever the revision was uh, for a possible referral at that point for hearing, one would have assumed that a lot of the discussion would have taken place at, in that case, it would have been CRC, unless at some point TSO had to get involved. And that the bylaw that was brought then back to the council for referral for hearing would have had a lot more um, opportunity for input before we used up the hearing process. That's that's what I think many of us have felt on this particular one, myself included. I, we can't hear you, Dorothy. Yeah. Uh, There's a complication in that the planning board has also been... Right. It's just been a very unwieldy structure that goes round and round and discussions are had and it seems to be this understanding on something, but no votes are taken anywhere. Andy, can I... Rock make a, you know, at the risk of maybe overstepping. I don't know if we want to have this discussion um, at I, this meeting only because we have like seven departments that are coming up, and this is a, I think Lynn, you mentioned this is a topic. This is that, a GOL discussion. Yeah, it is. Not that it's not a good discussion to have. I just I see right. the, the hands lining up, and I'm worried we're gonna go over time quickly. Uh, so 
thank you for bringing that up because I was thinking similarly. Um, I know your hands up, but it's taken it down. So Kathy, I was going to say the same thing Sean did and clarify that the process uh, TSO didn't formally vote formally vote on um, every aspect. We did kind of a straw poll in my recollection, but same same comment that Sean had. Thanks. Kathy. Yeah, I'm totally ready to move on. And my my question, it kind of runs through the others as well. Um, I have a sense of we have a very short staff at the critical town town staff level in finance and and other departments. So trying to think of as we get to the other, I just you'll see my questions where I worry about where I, I, I want to make sure we use scarce resources well would be the best way to say this. Yeah. So I let me just respond to that from a council um, perspective. And that is that, you know, as we become a more mature council and gotten to know people in town hall, I think sometimes we've forgotten that uh, we are in fact supposed to go through Paul to access town for research or anything else. And one of the things that we need to do with all of our um, priorities, if you will, is look at what town staff are going to have to get involved in, whether they have the bandwidth to take it on. And that, that's, that's the larger point, Lynn. So as we go through the others as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the last question is sort of along those lines or some comments, but I'll just do the questions for today. Um, should there be a longer discussion at the outset of creating goals regarding budget constraints um, and the need to make uh, difficult choices or trade-offs? Absolutely. I mean, I can expand on that. I think we're seeing it now when we get to the 23rd and we have to start making any kind of recommendations to change what the town manager has recommended. The sharp and harsh words people are going to have to hear is, yes, you'd like to increase that or get rid of that, but at the cost of what? And, you know, it is what it is. We only have so much money. So th these are all questions around how can the council, frankly, behave better? And I think that there's yeah. one other element that I will... Um, bring up at appropriate times that I want to discuss now is that as we propose things that we recognize the staff time required to implement it if passed and uh, that uh, we take some responsibility for considering uh, what the cost is both in staff time and in the ability to pursue to proceed uh just so uh bernie and then i want to get back yeah just you're going to hear it from me later as well uh it's been something i've i've mentioned i think repeatedly that we're too thin um <clears throat> and i think lynn's point about uh staff behavior that you really need to go through channels even though you might know somebody in some department is is one that uh that's a, that's a good one. I mean, there's the formal table of organization and then there's the way things really work. And at some point they should kind of line up. So thanks. Well, thank you, Bernie. Sean, back to you. Uh, so that's it for sort of submit um, written council questions. Again, there were some additional comments that I'll send out when we um, send out the updated do question document, but any final questions for town council's budget? Can I just mention that I worked with Athena directly on this budget and with Paul, and we had two reviews with uh, Sean and Paul and Holly and yep. uh, Athena and myself. Uh, and um, at, I even said to Athena, I said, do you want to request any additional um, help and we pretty much agreed no, but I do want to note that she is going to have an intern this fall, which is really nice. Dorothy has her hand up. Athena also has her hand up now. Hey, Athena. Just wanted to note that the intern isn't coming out of the council budget. 
and the the extra help I'd like to sort of leave on the back burner because um, I, I do need extra help, frankly, but I re recognize that it's just not going to be possible in this budget. Right. Thank you, Ms. Hayden. Dorothy, is there anything else on this because we need yeah. to move on? Well, this is probably the wrong place, but I just want to make sure that we're not going to miss it again. Um, the, there was a mention at a previous meeting of um, a revolving fund for babysitting co costs for people at committees, and that can include council members. And then I remember I was told that there was something in the works to um, increase the council pay. And I remember being told it was only going to cover a part of the year. But um, if this is a council budget, shouldn't there be something in this one? So that hasn't been approved or um, or discussed at the council level yet. So and it went to bed by the time the town manager had submitted his budget proposal. Um, I think Andy, you've noted in the if that is approved before July one, it would be it would be half a year that we would have to um, figure it out. Um, the the child care money is in the budget. It's, it's just in the, not in yeah. this council budget. It's in the we'll hear about that in a second. Budget. Yeah. And, and that could be done without the council vote because it's actually a practice we've had in the past. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other two questions about pay and uh, council pay and uh, ins an ability to have insur health insurance mm -hmm. are still on the in the finance committee and have been delayed hoping to get the teacher and other contracts settled. But if not, we will take it up in June. Okay, just want to make sure that uh, that my my keeping my mouth shut doesn't mean oh we missed it again. That's that's all it's, I'm trying to. It's not been dropped. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. So back to Sean then. Let's move to the town manager budget. All right. So heading to the town manager budget. Um, again, we've just been doing questions and answers. So Paul, are you ready? I am, and okay. Brianna and Angela are here too. Okay. Uh, so this is sort of a technical question. Your number of staff have decreased. You went from four uh, staff members to three. Has the workload intensified or have there been opportunities to streamline? Uh, the workload continues to intensify. The, um, as you recall, when we created the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, we took the halftime position from the town manager's budget that had been shared halftime with um, HR and half time with town manager and move that as the assistant director of DEI. We took the economic development director position and made that the DEI director position. And that was in an effort to minimize increasing staff. And I know we, we talk about increasing staff, but that's something we've been really holding back on as much as possible because that's the, the major cost center for us as we move as an organization that those expenses once, in, once included into budget don't, um, don't let up. Uh, we are short staffed in, in the town manager's office. You know, we are experiencing more and more frequently where we don't have someone on the floor on the mezzanine level to answer the phone, uh, to greet people. So today we had to lock the office uh, just because there wasn't anybody on the floor. So we're experiencing that kind of um, lack of coverage sometimes. Um, but typically someone's here, so we try to manage it as best we can. So the town manager had a 25% increase in operating expenses. How much of this is attributable to um, CPOs, uh, stipends for CPOs, and the child care pilot? Okay. So the um, when we create this, the charter requires us to have a CPO the position. When we when I looked at that, when the charter passed, uh, we had three super talented people who were really phenomenal. Uh, employees that I asked them each to take on a piece of it and they all willingly did. They were never truly compensated for this. And if we were to move to a different model, we don't have anything budgeted. So $15,000 of that, that would equate to about $5,000 for each CPO at this, the way we have it set up now um, is what we have budgeted in the increase. The other $5,000 is for um, the childcare um, pilot. And so the child care pilot, the rest of the question was raised, is for all elected officials. Um, that would include the Board of Library uh, Commissioners, that's how we call them, um, the um, school committee, and the Amherst uh, Town Council. And this is, we have it sort of set up the way it would be with um, 
the um, if the council approves this the way we did the way town meeting used to do it. So if you had child care expenses, you would uh, submit those expenses to the manager's office and we'd reimburse you for those expenses. Lynn? Yeah, I don't want it to go unnoticed that many times other uh, the CPOs and also particularly Angela do what I would think of as council work. And so that it's really, we really appreciate that. Uh, it should be recognized, for instance, Angela is often the one trying to pull together a meeting that includes the town manager and other people. So it's um, it, saying that we only have a portion of Athena first of his, his faults and saying that we don't have any other assistance is also false. So I wanna take the opportunity to thank them for that and also to acknowledge it toward everyone else. Thank you. Ernie? Uh, yeah, the, the other piece of that question was why childcare and not family care because a um, yeah. number of no, people have uh, may have family members who need to have some level of assistance while they're absent. Uh, no, we um, would expand. You're right, Bernie, on that. That was just an oversight on my part when I wrote it. It should have included um, you know, elderly or disabled family member mm -hmm. care as well. Okay, and there's nothing in the budget that would allow us to pay for cloning Athena. <laughs> Uh, I think that needs to be remedied. Maybe uh, UMass can so assist with that. Um, <laughs> who knows? Thank you. Thanks. So the next question, um, it's a longer question, but in short, Paul, it's about um, the number of department heads that you oversee um, and your plan to, to maybe address that. Yeah, so this was brought up in my uh, performance review by the council as a concern. Um, we are doing a, a compensation and classification study right now for department heads. And with the information that that firm collects, um, I am anticipating putting some reorganization work in this summer, uh, working with our department heads and maybe submitting something to the, in the fall to the council. That's the goal. And I, and I think the span of control is pretty broad. Uh, direct reports are too many. Um, and trying to streamline that in a slightly more hierarchical fashion would be helpful for the town. Okay, this, this again is one of my uh, uh, gripes, pet peeves, whatever. Uh, welcome that. The planning, Paul, in the meantime, please don't get hit by a bus. <laughs> okay, go to the next one. Um, so Paul, two new working groups have been proposed. Mm -hmm. uh, the School Fiscal Sustainability Working Group and then the Economic um, Task Force. Are there so, any funds in the operating budget to meet these, uh, help support these activities? And uh, what are the prospects for an economic development coordinator in the future? Yeah, so the for the internal working group, that's a, well, that won't start quite not yet because the finance <laughs> director for the uh, school department has been named the acting superintendent. So he, he and Sean are the key figures in that group. It's actually going to streamline decision making. Um, <laughs> it's, going to, it's going to be a lot easier. <laughs> so uh, again, our the mission on this is to be completed by the end of the calendar year. So hopefully, we'll we'll see how that works out. But Doug is an, a key part of that, um, as is Mike, quite honestly. Um, so there's a little bit of a monkey wrench in that one. So, but it's something that has to be done uh, in terms of the economic development task force. Um, I'm anticipating that we'll have some um, funding allocated for this um, to help support the economic development work. The task force itself won't have a budget, but it'll involve people from the university, the colleges, the business community, and others um, who, who would be involved in looking at this. We don't have a funded position, and most likely this would fall, probably fall to um, Dave Zomek or someone in his team to help support. I think that is it. There's one more. Oh, I think. oh, yeah, there's a couple more. Sorry. Um, or, yeah, one more. Uh, about the Comcast contract, which is up for mm -hmm. negotiations. Those are funding um, in the law budget account to accommodate these negotiations. And will KP law assist or will it be necessary to hire outside counsel? Right now, we're planning on using KP law. They do have someone who does cable contracts on staff. Um, in the end of this uh, 
in 2024, I think, is when we start the, um, uh, what's it called? Ascertainment. Assess ascertainment process, yeah. yeah. So it's a lead up to the contract negotiations. Um, and so it's a pretty lengthy project. Auntie was pretty in intimate with it last time. Um, so there's two, actually two things that have to be negotiated. One is the license agreement with Comcast. And then once that is completed, there's the um, companion agreement with whoever is going to be providing the services for um, PEG services, you know, and that right now is Amherst Media. And that is it for town manager questions. Any other town man manager questions? Um, anybody in the committee? Kathy? Kathy? I don't have a, a, another question, uh, but this is my section of the finance of our budget review to write up. So Sean, as you're getting answers, but also you're getting the questions, if you can just compile the questions for me because some of these aren't questions I sent in just so I can mm -hmm. capture um, the information we've collected. Yeah, I have all the questions and I'll send them out. Um, I sent an updated, I sent a version last week and there will be another updated version with the new questions that have gone out. I don't have most of them I have written responses for when, if we have them in enough time, but I don't have written responses for all if they were just answered at the meeting. Um, yeah, no, and, and I'm not even asking, you know, because I okay. can always catch the, the Zoom. I just need to know what the question is. Yeah, yeah, I have. I'll, I'll send those out. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Any other town manager questions? Okay, then, okay, to move to the next section, Andy. Go for it. So the next section is my section or finance section, and we have um, so finance has uh, really three key department heads who handle all the day-to-day -day work and, you know, really um, are the ones that help give finance such a good reputation. And that's uh, Jennifer LaFountain, who's our treasurer collector, Kim Yu, who's our principal assessor, and Holly Drake, who's on vacation this week, but most of you know Holly Drake, she's our comptroller. Um, so they will help uh, answer some of the questions that have been raised if, uh, if applicable. Um, Kim or Jen, either of you wanna say anything, you don't have to, but if there's anything you wanted to say, now's a good time, okay. All right, so the first question, um, is staffing adequate? Is staffing adequate? Um, I think is the first question and, and I'll, Jen or Kim, if you wanna go first, you can, otherwise I'll jump in. I think we just finally got back up to full staff. So we are, um, I think we're in pretty good shape for right now. Um, we're in a little transition with training, but other than that, I think we're in good shape. Probably the same for you, Kim, right? Yes. I was just going to say we have um, someone retiring momentarily and have filled that spot already as well as the other um, part-time position that we have. So I think we're in pretty good shape other than just getting up and running and training. Yeah, I think I think I can speak for accounting a little bit. Generally, I think the staffing is adequate when we're at full strength and everyone has been trained and um, knows their uh, position well where we've gone through a lot of transition, mostly due to retirements, as you all know. Um, uh, but even before Sonia, we had a, a chain of retirements. Um, and so we're slow, I think we're near nearing the end of that period of transition. Um, we've got one more position to fill in the office. Um, that's a, sort of a critical position that we have to provide training for. And then we still have a few people that are in their first year or two in their position um, that were so a lot of our efforts in this coming year around training and support for those those individuals. But again, when we're fully staffed and when everyone is feels comfortable in their role, um, staffing, I think, is adequate. Can I, I, I do right after recognize that there is a whole new team on the in the finance department for the most part. They've, uh, hun, over 100 years worth of experience walked out the door in the last few months and um, for retirements. And so it's really good that they've been pretty diligent about recruiting really good people um, and getting, but it's the training and getting people up to speed and losing all that institutional knowledge is going to take some time. Mm -hmm. Kathy? Um, yeah, the, I asked one I put in specific, um, Sean, is we have just one procurement officer. Yeah. And, and, and I'm, you know, I, if we're going along at kind of a steady state, I could see one doing it. But if we if we hit a lot of road contracts coming out, then we're also doing Centennial Plant. And then I don't know, as we start to do 
the school a year from now where we're actually got, yeah. con- you know, so I'm just, and, and the person's relatively new. So it's, it's a question of relative new, but also just one um, yeah. so it's a sense that you you'll be able to manage that as what I see a crunch. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. Um, so uh, Simone Christopher, she's our procurement officer, and she is incredibly organized. She's been um, a real asset in that role from an organization standpoint. Um, and I think you hit the nail on the head, Kathy. Uh, there's parts of the year where one person is is fine, and she can help out and back up other departments. And then there's times where it's kind of straight out, and that's just the nature of how we do procurement, especially with you know a five year capital plan where all the funds become available on July first. Um, you know, there's sort of a crunch in the in the late summer fall to get all those uh, projects awarded. Um, I will say, again, given her organization, a lot of the times the crunch isn't necessarily with procurement. It's the crunches with when we have lots of funds, um, the specifications that have to be created for projects are really the time consuming piece. Um, you know, roads may seem straightforward, but they have to be designed and all the details have to be worked out. Um, again, I would say that the specification development piece is the most time consuming part of a procurement. And often that is not most more often than not, than not, that's not Simone doing that. That's the department doing it. Um, so I think that's the area we would look at to try to um, push things through. And m- what we've been talking about, we allocated some funds for a capital projects manager from ARPA. We have not been uh, able to find someone to fill that role. Mm-hmm. Um, and so one thing we're looking to do as sort of a, an alternate that actually I think might work better is um, look to get a, an architect or an owner project manager on contract essentially to handle multiple projects, to be available for departments to contact um, for some of these medium, small, medium sized projects to help them develop the specifications more rapidly um, and be able to push more through. Um, so we're gonna be looking to do that hopefully in the next month or two. And then the other piece is for some of these big projects, like you noted, we can rely on our OPMs and architects for those projects to handle a lot of the procurement. Um, so, for example, with the MSBA, the nice thing about the MSBA is it's such a prescribed process that we don't actually have a lot to do with. We have, you know, we have to update and get all the information in, but um, their documents are so standardized that there's not a lot for us to do. Um, so, so your question's a good one. I think there is a lot of procurement going on, um, and there's different different ways we can help it ease through the through the process faster. Thank you. Um, the next question that we sort of addressed, you talked about turnover and the ability to attract and keep highly qualified experienced staff. I think the good news is we've been able to attract um, and retain staff, which has been nice. We do have, as Paul mentioned, several new staff, but um, we've been really happy. We were nervous when we went out to hire because it's been such a tight um, job market, um, but we've been really satisfied with the people that we've brought in and our ability to kind of incorporate them as part of the team. Um, and we do have a because finance, accounting, collectors, and the assessors, we all kind of work in one big office. Um, it's really critical that everyone works well together and uh, gets along and can back each other up and feel supportive. Um, and I think everybody on the team can do that. Um, Kim or Jen, I don't know if you feel differently, hopefully not, but it seems like everyone's uh, <laughs> meshing well. They're gonna say I'm the one that's kind of throwing everything off. <laughs> Good. Kim, Jen, anything you wanna to add to that? Okay. Um, Jen, I'm gonna let you start with this one. Uh, there's a question about ambulance billing collection rates um, and just how they're sort of historically, you know, we generally have really high collection rates, but ambulance billing is one of those uh, that just historically is low. When we did it in-house, it was low. We contracted it out. It's still low. It's just sort of the nature of the beast. But do you want to uh, speak to that a little bit? Um, I, I think it's kind of a tricky thing to track because there's so many different variables that go in as far as um, certain insurances cover a certain amount, and then there's a copay for the patient, or um, in the instance of Medicare or Medicaid, there's large write offs that happen on the different charges. So um, we're, I think we're going through a ground ambulance support review that's nationwide um, in hopes to increase the Medicare rates. So that way, everybody's seeing a little more money coming in on those bills at some point once. It's going to take, I think, three to five years to get that done nationwide. And then the other piece of it is we have a very transient population in terms of, you know, UMass students come in or college students come in and then they leave. Um, and it's not always uh, simple to, to track down an overdue bill. 
So that when you show collection rate, then you're saying if if you bill for five hundred dollars and you only get three hundred, you're showing that in the rate, so that the, that's part of what goes into this computation. I just thought it was literally we didn't collect anything on thirty percent of the bills, but but it's but it's computed. I didn't know what the accounting system was. That was my question. You know, on it, we we have a seventy percent collection rate in twenty twenty two. Right. Okay. Thank yeah, you. And we yeah. um, we use Comstar. So again, we used to do it in house. Um, we thought contracting it out may boost up the rate, um, but it actually stayed about the same. Or um, did, it, did it get better or worse when we out, went outside with it? I don't. It may have got better a little bit, but I don't think it's improved enough to to yes. be yeah. impressed with. Okay. <laughs> Bernie. I'm just curious if any of the insurance companies have attempted uh, the old trick of paying the policy owner rather than uh, the ambulance department, uh, our, our ambulance department. There's one question. The other question is, Is it uh, does it look like we might ever get to the point where we'd have to take some people to small claims court to uh, collect uh, uh, ambulance fees when there's no insurance, uh, uh, no uh, uh, primary payer other than the, the person who's transported? Um, that's a good question. We haven't, um, we have, we, right now we use a collection agency. Um, so any bills that are over a certain point, um, we've been moving on to Greg Hill as our collection agency. They just got bought out. So we have to do some research with the new company. Um, but we're actively trying to, to recoup as much as we can with that. Um, and the answer about paying the patient, I have seen that over the time I've been here where example, Blue Cross will send the full check to the patient and not send it to us. And then we have to work with them to get it back. So blue, the yeah. blues are still doing that. Okay, <laughs> unfortunately, good. thank you. The good news is overall, the ambulance fund has been doing, um, you know, it obviously dropped off a little bit during the pandemic, um, but we have seen it rebound. And this one has rebounded pretty quickly, especially because we increased rates right before um, right before the pandemic. So um, so there's room to improve, but it is doing pretty well. Um, and then the last question here is about parking permits and is the new system pricing working as expected, um, yielding more money? And the answer is yes. So uh, the third quarter report will come out. It's almost done. So we should be able to get out to you the next week or so. Um, so you'll see the sort of year over year comparison, but the uh, town center permits definitely brought in quite a bit more money this year. Um, and Jen actually is working on the notice for next year, which phases in the next um, piece of the permit system uh, pricing updates, which it goes up another chunk next year. Um, it was a three-year plan that we worked out to phase in the new pricing. Um, the first year was the biggest chunk. So the biggest, you know, the, the biggest step up was, is already complete, uh, but there'll be another step up for FY24. Bob? Yeah, if there aren't any other questions, um, I just had a question. Um, you know, the, the federal debt ceiling negotiations may result in a clawback of COVID, unspent COVID funds. Do we have a sense of how much we might be at risk for? I know this is all up in the air right now, but yeah. I think we ought to be cognizant of that the possibility that these these funds might be clawed back. Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, so there's a couple of things. If the debt ceiling negotiations, depending on how they go, if there's some sort of shutdown, uh, that could impact the, uh, the town and the schools, um, particularly through grants, grants that are not, uh, there's certain types of grants that are um, subject to annual appropriations that the money might stop flowing for those grants. And so that's one concern. Uh, the other piece, I was at a um, conference on um, Wednesday about the possible clawbacks, uh, the uh, and Andy, you actually know this person well, Jackie Lavender Bird, who's the legislative analyst for MMA. Um, I actually asked her that very question, Bob, um, if, if MMA had been hearing anything. Um, you know, her response was that what they've been hearing is that the the, the federal level they've been looking more at trying to claw back. They they st originally started with some of the COVID relief funds, but they recently they've been turning more towards the Inflation Reduction Act 
which is also not good for us, um, as Kathy knows, because some of the, um, you know, we're we're also hoping to get some funding back uh, from the Inflation Reduction Act related to the school project. Um, so if any clawbacks or changes in the law happen there, that would also not be good for us. Um, but if there were uh, with the ARPA funds and ESSER funds, I don't know about for ESSER because I, I don't, uh, the schools would have to answer that. Um, but with ARPA, we've got about $4 million that we've obligated we have about 7 million left that hasn't been technically obligated. Now we have plans for those funds and, and we'll be coming to you all to share a plan. Um, but what I'll say, Paul and I are still working on this, but the there may be a, a mechanism to get it all obligated quickly that we might share with you that would not, um, it, it would essentially give the council maybe more control over those funds, but it would get it obligated so it's no longer ARPA money. Um, so that we could say it's all it's all taken essentially. Um, it's gonna, we're gonna have to really do a lot of communication and, and communication around that because some people may feel like it's um, like it's not what it was meant for, but at the risk of losing the funds, uh, I think we wanna do what we can to make sure we don't lose any of those funds. Um, so we'll we'll communicate that and explain what that what, you know give more details. But essentially, with ARPA, every community was allowed to take a sort of a flat ten million dollar revenue loss if they wanted to. Um, originally, before all this conversation started around clawing back, we you know we were going to use some revenue loss, but we were going to try to dedicate as much for projects as possible. Um, but given the talk around this, um, we may want to do this revenue loss piece, which again doesn't lose the money. It just um it takes a different form that the council would then have to appropriate um so nothing set in stone there paul and i again will be back to talk with you all about that that's one option we're considering um but it's for that very reason that you you noted bob which is we don't want to um right. you know we're concerned about that as well yep okay thanks any other questions on finance i think that's all the ones that were submitted there's some other questions about benefits and utilities that I'll weigh in on when we get to those sections, but all right. Um, so our next department is human resources. Um, Melissa, do you want Kay brought in the room as well? Or um, she's yeah, in the Kay, okay. Hi, everyone. Um, Kay does have the link. I think she's on the phone right now, but she'll be joining us. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if everyone's met Melissa. Melissa is our new human resources director. Um, she's doing a great job. She's managing the office through a transition right now and um, holding down the fort. And so uh, I think I sent these questions to you, but I'll just read them off, Melissa, and then you can address them. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so the first question is, um, uh, you know, has there been a high staff turnover rate? Um, and I don't know if it, it wasn't clear if this is specific to just the human resources department, but or the town more broadly. Um, I would say probably the town more broadly would cover both. Um, and what's what's the current status um, in terms of what you're seeing in staff turnover? Um, I would say that there's been a uh, turnover rate consistent with what we see in all industries right now. It's more than what we've seen in the past. Um, it's it's a, it, uh, we see a couple come and a couple go, I'd, I'd say uh, a month. And I think that's consistent with all industries. Um, so, you know, in HR, that just means a little bit of an uptick in our yeah. usual work. <laughs> so we've been doing a lot of onboarding, a lot of um, recruitment and stuff like that. And I'm sorry, what was the second piece of that? Um, no, I think that addressed it. Um, the current status of, of uh, staff turnover. And I think we're going to be seeing this for a little bit. I don't think it's going to stop anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Bob? You know, I have a kind of related question, which is uh, what new staff are we looking for in the future? I mean, one of the op one of the thoughts is we might have to increase CRESS, uh, you know, the staffing for CRESS. So what are some of the things that you're looking at in terms of additional staff beyond what we have now, more, you know, irris irrespective of the turnover um, that we might have to budget for into the future. Are you um, speaking about new positions or replacements? New positions. Well, I think we, we have had a lot of requests from departments for new positions uh, across the board and includes water, sewer, um, you know, every department literally has come in 
uh, including crests. But uh, uh, you know, I think we just don't have the capacity to take on new positions, and so um, that's sort of where we're stuck right now. And we we are also we we are still we've added you know we've added the ten positions in the crest department. We've added the four positions in the fire department. You know, but Sean, would you say pretty much every department has asked for additional staffing? Well, finance hasn't asked for additional staff. I, <laughs> I, I just, I just said that, but, um, but, but to your point, um, many there were many requests: sustainability, um, public works, um, you, you know, technology. We we see a potential need around cybersecurity. Um, so there are a lot of requests for new positions that are very um, valuable new positions that would would be helpful. Um, but to Paul's point, we're you know we're taxing as much as we can. We're we're looking for all the revenues we can, um, and and so unless there's some sort of change that results in more revenue, um, adding more staff is a struggle, especially right now given inflation. Because you know we get so much new money every year, and the first thing we have to do is cover insurances and um, you know the outcome of collective bargaining agreements and so on. Um, and then when we look at what what's left over to potentially do new things, um, that number has been shrinking the last few years. Lynn? Yeah, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but um, from I've been very clear that before we make any commitment to re increasing CRESS, we need to see the evaluations. And I think that we need to make a have a priority as we look at the budget in the for the coming year to understand what some of these unmet needs are in other departments as well. I, you know, we just don't have an unlimited budget, and everybody wants something. Bernie? Yeah, there, there also seems to be a prevailing belief that any money for CRESS will come out of the police department. Um, in real life, and when you've had uh, uh, community response departments operating, uh, there's been some relief of the workload on the police, but nothing that would um, be of such significance that you could reduce the police budget by 50%, which is a number that's been kicked around and frankly, in my humble opinion, it's pulled out of the air. Um, so um, it, it, we're gonna have to be very careful going on, uh, going forward. And folks are also gonna have to take into account the fact that some of these positions that aren't necessarily public facing uh, are pretty important. We can't, we, 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 we can't uh, expect to sustain our public services, our public safety, our public health unless there's adequate support behind that. That means folks in the back office, uh, because there's lots of work that has to go on to, to keep those uh, uh, keep uh, town employees who are in the field, in the field. End of sermon, thank you. Kathy? I, yeah, this is jumping forward a little bit to uh, another department when we get to town facilities, but I just don't know whether it's come up at the Melissa level. When we um, when we have a brand new school that's all electric with geothermal and solar, we have a school with much more sophisticated uh, HVAC system than anything we've got now. And as we do similar kinds of changes in the town hall and town buildings, so I'm trying to think forward, will there be a need for a high level facility person with a technical expertise that works across school, town, library, so that each of those doesn't have to have the capacity. Um, and we, I saw this in Springfield, they have, well, it's a much bigger urban area, but you know, just trying to think about um, that as Jer Jeremiah and, um, and then Rupert, what they will be facing. And in one case, it's not till 2026, but we're going to be getting it in some of these others. So it's it's just something to be thinking about, not so much a new staff, but trying to think about where that kind of staff person is. And then it's a shared, uh, a shared resource. Um, so we don't tend to budget that way with these departments, but you know, you're in a department rather than working the, the big departments, the, the big ones, not, you know, Sean's finance where everyone works together. Yeah. So it's yeah. that's just that's a looking forward kind of question. Yeah, the, I mean the 
just the likelihood of the town finding a person who can do that it'd be great if we could my guess is it's going to be very difficult to find somebody with um those types of expertise that could work solely for the town um but to your point we will definitely need maintenance if we can't we will need maintenance contracts we will need um, things in place that have professionals that do that type of work um, but again I just knowing at the schools where we employed a number of specialists like plumbers and electricians and um, carpenters it's you know the the private sector especially for those types of positions is much more um, advantageous um, and so it's yep. difficult to get find people like that to work for the for the municipal side thanks so the next question Melissa is about um, just giving an update on the the market wage study Excuse me. Yes, we've gotten pretty far. We've um, had our initial employee meeting with our consultant who is GovHR um, backtracking and RFP went out in January and um, they were they were awarded the bid. Um, that's coming out of our uh, our capital request or uh, 20 FY23 capital request budget of, of $40,000 and the contract amount was uh, 25 eight. Um, so anyhow, uh, GovHR has met with us. Um, they've gave, given all of the employees the lowdown about um, what we're doing, how we're doing it. The employees were given a job analysis questionnaire um, to answer questions about the work that they do in the positions. Um, they were then uh, given to the supervisors to review and they've all been submitted now. Uh, interviews with employees one-on-one uh, -on -one with the consultant will begin on Monday. Uh, there are five people working with all of our non-union members to complete those with next week. Also, our um, surveys, our salary surveys have gone out to our um, 21 comparable communities, and we hope that they will answer. I know that at least three of them have sent me a copy of what they submitted. It's going right to a survey um, engine, so I haven't seen who's answered yet. But um, I think that's progressing pretty well. And I think we'll have some initial recommendations by uh, the beginning of, or um, early part of FY24. Thank you. Lynn? Yeah, just a question on the salary comps. Um, are you taking into consideration when you look for comparable towns, uh, what the cost of living is in that area of the state? And to be honest with you, with housing prices so high in Amherst, uh, we start looking a little bit like at least a Middle Eastern, a mid mid Eastern, not a Middle Eastern, mid Eastern <laughs> Massachusetts, um, that you know might be a far reaching bedroom community for Boston. But uh, I just wanted to make sure that we do at least consider that um, issue of some places are just more expensive to live. We are, we are considering um, location, cost of living, average um, salary. Mm -hmm. um, we also, we are even thinking about looking at, well, we have asked a few communities with universities, state colleges to also um, answer. Um, but, you know, we have our, we have them prioritized with most comparable, which what we think is most comparable and then others. Um, but yeah, we have looked at a lot of factors, including including that cost of living. In reality, when you, the university basically pays similar across the state, so it doesn't take into consideration um, where you live in the state. Uh, just a, That's just an aside and a caution. Thank you. And then the last question um, is about uh, collaborating with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and how that work has been going. Yeah, I've enjoyed um, collaborating with that office. We actually were able to do two trainings together at our first professional day events, and we'll continue to collaborate in that way. And I've worked very closely with them and will continue to work with them on the hiring process, recruitment, and how to make it better, shore it up, how to increase our pool of diverse candidates. And um, I've been working with the assistant director on that pretty closely. And um, so, yeah, I'm enjoying that partnership. And it's, I think it's fruitful. And we'll have the same question for Pamela in a, in a few minutes. So, Any other questions for human resources? I, I just want to thank pa Melissa um, 
publicly. She came in at a difficult time, has endured some staff tur turnover, some pretty intense labor negotiations that's been going on and just ramped up this week again. So um, just sort of <laughs> powered through everything. So just really thank you, Melissa. Appreciate that. Thank you. Andy? Yeah, this is more a question for you but to Melissa, which is why I was waiting till the end. Um, as I was looking through this budget and then thinking about the other budgets, I realized that uh, what we've been doing by listing uh, under personnel services for each department, the salaries, but leaving the benefits um, into the into one general fund under general services, that we don't always reflect the full cost of the department because we're leaving such a large part of compensation into a separate uh, reporting mechanism. And uh, so it, it probably affects different departments differently because uh, a department where the salaries are relatively lower than the percentage that's going to be in uh, the benefits side of compensation is going to be higher. But uh, for future budgets, not for this budget, but for future budgets, I wonder if that top section in each budget where we talk about um, personnel services, operating expenses, and operating capital, whether we should be looking at um, what we can do to make sure that we're really looking at the full cost of each department. So uh, why don't we put that? Yeah, no, no, and, and that was a question that was submitted, so um, I can address that one now. So um, we could take a look at how to include that. It used to be included. What I'll say is the spreadsheet or the, the budget as it is now, if you add up all the different department pages, it adds up to our total budget um, as you would expect it to. Um, and in reality, in a, from an accounting perspective, we don't track health insurance by department. We have a health insurance account. And I think that's how it was at the schools as well. We don't, um, we would have lots of, lots of uh, nightmarish accounting situations if we were to track it by every department. Um, so we just have one account, you know, for active health insurance, another account for retiree health insurance and so on. Uh, we do have spreadsheets where we could um, translate that to department benefit costs. Um, if need be, and we could put it on those um, budget pages. But again, I, I would almost put it as like a pro forma, like below the line type thing, because um, we're still going to have an employee benefit section where you're going to want to see what is the overall cost of health insurance and how is it changing. It can sometimes, when you break it into granular by department, you can sometimes lose the full picture of our employee benefit costs because one person decides they're not going to get benefits that year and it looks like health insurance is going down or somebody decides they're going to take health insurance and it's going to go up um, and it looks like it's a really big increase. And, and sometimes, you know, we try to not talk about individual health insurance uh, decisions of employees. We, you know, we, you're not really supposed to tie any decisions to, you know, somebody's right to choose health insurance. Um, and when you, we, we have some small departments where it becomes pretty clear, pretty obvious when you see a big jump in health insurance. So that's why I moved away from it. And I think ultimately the most important thing is that global number and what we see happening there um, because it smooths out sort of the ins and outs. Um, but to your point, we we could do something to try to provide a little more context uh, yeah. around that. I, and I've been confused. I have done it both ways, Andy, as, as you know. And um, what, what, what happens is that it's, it's harder to analyze a department budget when you include that, because just as Sean said, if someone suddenly starts taking a family health plan, it just catapults that budget up. If it's a small department, you go like, why is this budget suddenly going up? It's not true. You're not able to compare it to the prior years. Um, and the, the thing that the council or the budget makers usually care about most about is what does health insurance cost us as a question? If we want to get into what do departments cost as a true sort of enterprise function, we can do that. But in terms of the decision-making process for this council and appropriating budget, I think this is a cleaner way to do it because you can really compare year-to-year -year operations of a budget, uh, of a department. Okay, well, thank you. 
And as I said, I really didn't think that this was one that I wanted to go into depth today because I think we're talking about a next year budget presentation question, which is it was a it was a question actually that was submitted by um, probably uh, Kathy. So it was you guys were thinking alike, Kathy. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, and when I, I actually, I think I asked it last year in the year, I may have asked it every year, but maybe the first time I saw the budget book. So I wasn't thinking down to the fine grain. I was thinking more at the total school budget. When we show just the wage part, we haven't showed the personnel part. So if we had the fringes, if we had health and pension, people would see this is, we are a people organization and that's what's driving our budget. So mm -hmm. And so, Sean, I'm wasn't you know down to the two person department or the okay. five person department um, doesn't make any sense to me for all the reasons you've just said, including pensions are somewhat more relative related to the level of the wages. Um, so, just thinking of some way of not having it. I, the first time I opened the budget book, I said, "Where's the health? Where's health insurance?" I would you know, to have to search for it mm -hmm. um, and pensions. So it might be sort of a simple table someplace that you show it in those initial things where you're not redoing your, your whole. Yeah, no, we could definitely do that. We could put it in the staffing section. There's a staffing summary. Um, we do a little bit of that during the financial indicators presentation. There's a, a chart um, that looks at sort of benefit costs, um, per, you know, personnel, salary and benefit costs. Um, but I don't know if we do anything where we roll in the schools as well, which we could do because they their budgets allow for that. So um, we could do something like, you know, our overall budget is $90 million. And of that, you know, 60 or whatever is pension, health insurance and, and salaries. So yeah, we could do that for next year. Yeah, And I just think it's important because it's um, particularly in since health insurance is one of the bugaboos, it's always go, it has been always going up faster. It's a bigger share of everything, but you want to know where's the money going. So it, it's a way of uh, saying add another 15% or another whatever ours is, um, you know, for the town. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's also one of the things that attracts people to work at the town of Amherst. I mean, it's 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 a good thing that we have the benefits that we do. So I'll stop. I just some simple way, not down to the, you know, small where one family plan versus one individual plan will skew it one way or the other. Bob? Huh? Yeah, I was just going to add, it would be helpful to see this summary over time, you know, in the five-year projections, because it's really important to know where all these expenses are going, especially since they are probably a majority of what we spend our money on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we have all that historical data where we could show a five-year, you know, to the up through the what we're budgeting for the following year. I'm sure you do. I just think it would be very helpful because, for example, when I was looking at, you know, the employee benefits. There was, there was no pension there. I had to go look at the assessment for pension, um, which is fine. Yeah, that's, that's just a, yeah, that's a structural decision the town had made a while back where um, we weren't going to charge pension costs to the operating budgets. And so, uh, so yeah, it's, a, it's right. just a structure, but you're, but no, you're no, no, at your no, point, no. Where it's not all in one place. Yeah, it's not all in one place. It would be helpful if it were all in one place, just so people could see it. Mm -hmm. I think that's the only request for new information for next year so far. So I'm going to just make sure I write, I write that down. Any other questions for human resources? I I had one other, and 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 it, there may not be a simple answer to this, but for the employee benefits, you know, writ large, what percentage of the cost is borne by the town versus the employee? Do you want me to take that, Melissa, or do you want to go ahead? Yes, John, if you could speak to that. Um, so for health insurance, um, for, um, and Kay here, correct me if I get this backwards, but um, for HMOs, it's 75-25 split, and for PPOs, it's an 80-20 split. And the the unique thing, not unique thing, but the one of the, again, benefits of working for Amherst is that we maintain that split into retirement. Many communities, when you retire, you, they drop to a lower um, allocation, but Amherst um, maintains that. Um, so that, again, that's just something to know. Thank you. Is that retaining of that something that's negotiated in contracts? 
Um, that's a good question. I don't think it's in. I don't believe it's in the collective bargain agreements explicitly. No. But no, it's, it's not. It's yeah. it's not. So and but we do have people move to Medicare when they are of age, right? Yeah. Right. As soon as somebody, um, we try to move people to Medicare as soon as they're eligible, and we actually one of the programs that we implemented, I think this past year, um, with the help of Maya, was the um, sort of the the even if they missed the original opportunity to go into Medicare, we moved them over and, and we're paying the penalty. But it's financially more advantageous for us to pay the penalty and get them into Medicare than the alternative. Um, and so that saved us um, quite a bit of money this past year. And, it, and we're also paying a share of the either a share or all of the Part B premium, which is a is a big benefit. Um, yeah, we have generous retiree benefits, which is one of the again that's it's one of the hard things when we're recruiting. Um, I think fewer and fewer people nowadays look to the retiree benefits as part of the compensation package, but it really is on the municipal side one of the um, and particularly in Amherst, it's one of the the it's a huge component of their compensation that we offer and trying to help them understand that um, is a challenge that Melissa has. So. What yeah. is, how Kay. many years must you be with the town to be vested? I think Kay had risen, raised her hand. She can probably answer all these questions. Kay? <laughs> um, you have to have 10 years of service to be vested with retirement system. Um, and unfortunately they don't, we have no, vesting requirement with the town itself um, and to be eligible to retire with benefits it's the vesting with the retirement system so occasionally uh, and they they used to see it a lot in the schools when um, they were doing the school uh, lunch folks that would come from another community and and not have um, retirement benefits for health insurance uh, and they would come to Amherst to do a, a couple of years and then retire from Amherst. Um, because if you accept a provision of the law uh, for health insurance for retirees, uh, the mandate is that you must pay at least 50% uh, once you've accepted that section of the law. Um, historically, Amherst has uh, treated their retirees the same as active employees and you've paid and people pay the same uh, when they retire as they do as an active employee and we Thank did you. to answer the question about medicare um, we reimburse part of the medicare part b premium um, we're required by state law if we enroll people in medicare part a um, we have to pay the Part A premium if they don't have it for free, and we have to pay any penalties associated with enrollment into Medicare. So if there are any penalties on either A or B, uh, we're on the hook for that. But as Sean said, it does save us considerable money uh, in our health care costs. So it's, it's probably well worth it. Bernie? Yeah, the classic trade-off with uh, for public employees is that you you, you get better retirement benefits uh, uh, at the end rather than a higher salary through through the year. And um, I would strongly encourage the town to continue the retirement benefits. You also have to keep in mind that if you have Social Security, you've earned Social Security and you then retire uh, on a state pension, you inquire you uh, uh, get hit with what's called a WEP, a windfall elimination provision, which can cost you two thirds of your social security benefits. So that's another uh, that's another reason to help people out by giving them better uh, health insurance in retirement. And I'll just quickly add that retiree health insurance costs are a, one of our rising cost areas. They have been for a while. Um, people living longer is probably the major reason why, which is a good thing. Um, but it is an area that's going up and, and then in addition with the cost of health insurance rising so rapidly. Um, the, the silver lining is that our Medicare costs haven't actually risen that much. Um, 
we've had our premium increases for Medicare plans have been relatively low, pretty much flat um, for several years, which has been helpful. Um, but this is exactly why we contribute to our OPEB trust fund um, and why we continue to make contributions. Our OPEB trust fund's up over $10 million. We've got a ways to go. Um, but that's why we continue to make those contributions so that at some point we can, that fund will be able to generate some returns and actually help uh, alleviate some of the pressure on the operating budget from health insurance, from retiree health insurance. All right, any final questions on human resources? Thank you so much, Melissa. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you all, good to see you. So Pamela Young is up next. Hi, Pam, how are you? Hello, everyone. So um, we had a couple questions, Pamela, that I will uh, relay. Um, so the first one is how will the two person um, or how is the two person department working from the staff perspective? Um, how often are you teaming with other departments like HR, police, CRESS, um, working with community participation officers, and lastly, um, working with community partners like UMass or Amherst College? So the office is working very well with all of the uh internal departments, um, particularly as you heard with HR, um, but also with Crest, we've done a couple of events together. Uh, one of the objectives of the office is to work with every department on their DEI initiatives. And in the, uh, I guess, early winter, we did send out a DEI survey and assessment to try to start to get a read on what those initiatives will be. As we're beginning to go around and do training with each of the departments, we'll also have an opportunity to talk to them about their DEI initiatives. We have worked, uh, made contacts with both uh, Hampshire College, Amherst College, and UMass. I think the strongest connection has been with Amherst College, which has provided funding for a number of the cultural events that um, the office has supported. Thank you. And I'll, I'll give a, a staff perspective. Um, I've been to a couple of Pamela's uh, uh, trainings and events so far. Um, I think the two things that I would describe them as is accessible. They do a, a really great job of um, providing different ways to engage with the work um, and interactive. They're not, you know, sit back and listen to a, a one hour um, or go through a one hour PowerPoint. They're, you know, you're engaged and you're talking with people and working through um, pretty tough topics, but in a way that doesn't maybe feel as tough, you know, you're, 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 they do a good job of sort of um, disarming people, I think. Um, so I would say from a staff perspective, I've heard nothing but good things about um, DEI's role so far. Yeah, thank and, you. And just, just to add to that, I mean, what I what I appreciate is that Pamela has a real strategy and a strategic vision for how to engage people. And it's, it's, a, it's a ladder of engagement that she opens the door and starts to engage people and it, it broadens and then the word gets around and says, oh, that was actually fun. And pe more people show up the next one. So she's very, she's got this sort of plan going forward, which I've really appreciated. Thank you. And, and myself and a couple other counselors were one, er, one of the early ones at the survival center. Uh, and I, I just, I, I loved it. it. I went away having met people I'd never met in our community and hearing, um, you know, people's real experiences in life. So I, and Pamela's manner does just invite people to engage. So thank you. So oh, thank you. So on that note, I'll say that we're generally trying to host a staff only uh, workshop opportunity on a monthly basis. I think um, the staff have really appreciated the ability to learn uh, amongst their and with their peers. They feel that's a safe environment for them. And then we're trying to engage the community in events that are open to the public. And so tomorrow we will actually host another community event on allyship um, at the Bang Center uh, from 9.30 to uh, 11. All right, the next question, um, or the, the last question, then we'll open up for any other committee questions, is around, uh, the DEI director's role in forming and supervising the law enforcement oversight and community uh, safety, sorry, law enforcement oversight board and the community safety committees. Um, and is there advocacy for providing stipends for members of these two committees? Um, is that comp contemplated in this budget, which I can speak to, um, and how there's a lack of stipends for other volunteer committees, but um, specifically with DEI's role with those two um, committees, can you give an update, Pam? 
Deborah. Sure. So the uh, an RF, RFP went out uh, about four weeks ago for the Law Enforcement Oversight Board. It just closed on um, Monday of this week. So we'll have an opportunity to review the submissions um, and hopefully we'll have an uh, be able to select someone to do that work so that Law Enforcement Oversight Committee is not in existence yet. Um, we do anticipate that DEI will work very closely with the consultant if we're, one is hired in the establishment of that uh, um, committee. And then once it's established, we'll work obviously collaboratively with that board. Uh, but the creation of the board is envisioned as one that would be independent. So it would DEI would not be over overseeing the Law Enforcement Oversight Board. It would be a separate uh, entity. And, and then, I think I missed a, a section part. And then working with the community safety um, group as well. Yeah, so we've worked uh, very closely with uh, CRESS. Uh, currently, uh, we've provided some workshops for them on restorative justice practices. Earl and I have attended some events together. That working relationship is, is excellent. In addition, um, DEI and CRESS are hoping to share an AmeriCorps intern in the fall, and that intern would work exclusively on youth empowerment programming. So we have an, an excellent working relationship with CRESS. Mm -hmm. And then related to stipend, so um, right now there is a stipend for the um, CSSJC. Um, it's been coming out of Paul's budget, so it's uh, it's something that uh, Paul thought was important and therefore funded it. Um, there's no formal budget for committee stipends other than the council and school committee. Um, so if there, whatever comes out of uh, stipends for committees, um, that would be something we would look to include in a future budget once that's determined. And I'll just add that we do have a model to review from the city of Burlington or from the, um, Vermont that we're going to be taking a look at um, for a way in which to provide the stipends for those committees. Yeah. Okay. So are there any other questions for Pamela? I'll say... Um, the the cons just as an update and again you'll get a, a broader update um we are funding the the consultant position that pamela described through arpa we had a community engagement bucket that we didn't end up spending um all of the funding on ambassadors and that program and so um knowing that that work had to start soon that was something that's being funded through arpa and it's a one-time cost so we thought it fit the criteria of what we were trying to do with arpa Any, all right, no other questions. All right. Pamela, Thank you can go home. All right. Yes. Have a good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, Pamela. All right. Oh, Thanks, Matt, Pamela. Wait, wait, Matt right. do you have a question before Pamela leaves? No, not oh, for okay. Pam. Thank you, okay. Pamela. Nice all right. Yeah. Thank you, Pamela. Bye. Sean, I was just wondering about the timing of your ARPA presentation. Will that happen during, um, when, when you all think about doing that? I think June is what we were um, sort of, you know, May is a busy month with all <laughs> these meetings, but um, I think June is when we're, ready to come back and in that meeting will be a couple things it'll be sharing information on the programs that have been funded and and how those programs are doing um, and then laying out a plan and discussing some of the things that bob raised earlier um, some contingency planning that type of thing i think they talk with lynn about there's a couple meetings in june to just choose whatever we can do it whenever it's best depending on the agendas of the council right well and whenever you're ready so there's nothing in there that will affect um, this FY24 that we're looking at now. Um, so the way our so ARPA, um, the town manager can direct it. The council has accepted an off authorized spending, but Paul has taken the approach of working collaboratively with the council in terms of you know updating what it's going to be spent on and getting feedback. And so the first round of ARPA originally was about nine million dollars was sort of the total. Um, value of the first round that we worked with the council on. Um, when we come back, some of those things were super successful and we've put more money, we want to put more money into them. Some of them um, didn't pan out the way we were hoping and we didn't spend the money. And so that money will be part of the, the next step conversation. Uh, and so, so there are ways that the ARPA money will help FY24, but it's not a funding source for the budget um, in that way. 
And what we're really trying to do again is stay away from anything that would increase uh, the town's dependency on ARPA in terms of an operating dependency. Um, we're trying to get off of that with uh, with regards to the firefighter and EMTs. Right. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I think the next apartment is. IT. Let me hold on. Let me pull my switches. IT or is it election? Let's see. Oh, it's no, it's uh, Sue. So Sue is here. Town Clerk, so at that, thank you for joining. Um, so we have had a few questions. Hi, everyone. Hi, Sue. Hi. Hi. All right, so Sue, I'm just gonna I'm gonna kind of facilitate and read you the question, and then you can just go ahead. Um, so we've seen, and I know you sent some of these to me, but um, if you could just repeat them. So there's been a decline in passport and passport photos. Um, can you explain why there's been that decline? And then there was a question about does the public know we provide these services, but your answer is going to be we don't provide these services. So. Right, right, pretty much. <laughs> yes. So exactly. So when COVID hit, we um we we got out of the program because the town hall closed. So obviously we can't accept pa passport applications if we're not here. Um, we have not gotten back into the program at this point. And passport applications and passport photos kind of went hand in hand when people would come in to apply for a passport, they'd say, oh, and do you take pictures? So um, so just to keep in mind, um, you know, if we were to advertise that we do photos, I just want to caution our camera, we, I looked up, we purchased it in August of 2007. It's quite old. It takes kind of a crappy picture. So um, I would say that if we were to get back into this, we would have to purchase a new system for taking photos. And um, so that's that's that part of it. So that would explain why we're we're not taking any money in because we're not doing them. And um, I think that answered all of it. So wasn't there a logistical challenge as well with the having to separate the photos from the applications? No, actually, the logistical challenge was in the fact that um, as a town clerk or an assistant town clerk, we are federally um, restricted from accepting a passport application because we can issue a birth certificate and there oh, might okay, be fraud. Yeah, we were we were we had to um, divide and conquer in our office. So we had one person that could accept passports and that was it. So that created a logistical nightmare, so to speak, because if they're on vacation, you know, how do you keep notifying the public that, oh, we're doing them on these days, not on these days, and oh, they're not in this day, they're out that, that, you know. So, um, I mean, we worked best through it while we were doing it, but when COVID hit and it stopped, we just, we haven't picked it up since. Yep, thank you. All right, the next question is, um, not sure exactly what this is. Um, so there's been an increase in notarizations. Um, do you think that's due to the loss of other um, other entities providing notarization services in the area? And do we charge a fee for notarization? Yes, we charge five dollars per notarization. Uh, we did see a huge increase. I think it went from like ninety something to um, what was it twelve hundred something like that. Uh, it was huge. Um, so one of the reasons is definitely that Hastings closed because we know they had a notary on staff. Yeah, Kathy shaking her head, nodding her head. And mm -hmm. they actually were charging $15 a notarization way back when, and we were still at five. And so, um, and we also hear from clients when they come in and they say, yeah, we went to the bank first, but the, there's nobody on staff today or, or what have you, they were busy. So um, I would like to increase that fee to $10. Mm -hmm. I think it's warranted. Um, I'm hoping it will lower the, the you know the traffic at the counter because we spend an awful lot of time at the counter doing notarizations and it takes away from the work that we actually have to do so um but at the same time increasing it to 10 from five it's doubling it and i think we're going to still be ahead of the game at the in the end yeah and this um, is one of the yeah. few fee increases that have been requested other than ones that are planned um and i think paul you've already given the green light on this one in particular so yeah yeah kathy yeah, you know, I, I just want to say, Sue, it's an incredible um, welcoming public benefit that you're doing. Mm -hmm. So I realize it's a burden on you, but when the bank says you can go across the street and the town hall does it, people go, really? The town hall provides that service. I mean, it's just a nice it, it, there. And as you said, Hastings doesn't do it. The bank says, you know, go somewhere else. So um, 
you know, the, the, the number, the number, the increase is enormous. But uh, I think getting known for the fact that we do things for people is is a good thing. Um, oh, oh, absolutely. And, you know, um, what's interesting lately is that we've been getting a lot of walk ins for real estate closings, and we absolutely cannot do real estate closings by law. Um, so we've had to turn a few people away. I don't know what, why all of a sudden there's a the rise in real estate closings. But, um, you yeah, know, we're happy to do them. It's, uh, it's just, um, you know, when you're standing when my my management assistants at the counter for four hours out of seven and a half hours with just <laughs> notarizations, you know, it's like, okay, so, but um, okay. Um, another the last question is a very smooth transition to the new districts. Um, polling and, uh, you know, we use the new machines. Um, were there any issues from your perspective from the last election? None. I mean, well, I shouldn't say none. I would say 1%. There's the, the most common comment we were hearing was um, the voter didn't see the green check mark that said that their ballot was cast before they walked out of the polling place. And, you know, they were told by the person standing at the ballot box, you know, when you see that green check mark, your ballot's been counted. And either they looked away the second that check mark appeared and missed it. You know, so there was a little bit of, um, well, wait a minute, how do I know? So I think um, a little bit more training for the poll workers to make sure that the voter is watching that machine as they're putting the ballot in and not looking away. That's the only thing I can think of. But other than that, it was extremely smooth. The, the tabulators look very much like the old tabulator. So it's not a, um, there wasn't a huge learning curve. Um, we had no problems whatsoever. It was great. Dorothy? Yeah. Um, a question that has been raised recently um, <clears throat> is about, with the district changing, particularly uh, old district three be joining, becoming 4A, um, and there are four sitting councilors in, in, in that new district at this moment. Will the word incumbent be after all four of them? So I've already been asked that, and I've reached out to the Secretary of State's office. I'm waiting for an answer because I want an, a definitive answer on that. Um, I've never prepared a ballot post redistricting, so I'm not sure. So mm -hmm. I want to make sure we get this right. Yeah, I'll let I'll let the counselor that reached out to me know so that they can they can pass it on. Well, if we don't like what the Secretary of State says, what uh, <laughs> some of them get the word incumbent and others don't, there will be some objections. Okay, either everybody gets it or nobody gets it. Well, we have to follow the law. <laughs> oh, okay, it's going to be interesting what the answer is. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, Andy. Yeah, it's just curious with the elections, then uh, particularly since we just had one, uh, we are getting more people, you noted, on doing mail-in ballots and, uh, you know, whether the time and the cost to process the mail-in ballots is being um, recouped in any way or is for the purely town elections. Is that um, totally on the town budget? And then the second part to that goes is, have we been getting enough people who are doing um, mail-in and, and early voting that we ought to be reconsidering the number of polling locations? So your first question, Andy, was is, um... The mail-in balloting, is it being recovered by the town, the cost? Is that what you asked? Yes. And how is it a large expense and time and oh, gotcha. other expense? And are we getting any recovery on it? Uh, so we do get recovery for state elections. We get reimbursed. It's a non-funded mandate. Um, so for the fall elections, we were reimbursed 18000 but we don't get reimbursed for town costs on mail-in balloting. So... This past election, we had um, the quantity of ballots was was really good. I forget how what it was. I think fifteen hundred, but we were able to do it in house without extra help. We were right at the limit of what we could handle, but that was the limit. So there was there wasn't any additional expense to process them, is what I'm saying. Um, that's not the case for state elections. We get into the 8,000, 6,000 range where we don't have enough time to do them and we have to hire election workers. But again, we get reimbursed for that. Um, and then your second question, um, I'm not quite sure I understood. 
I just was curious because I, um, you know, I don't know what kind of difficulty you're having right now in finding election workers. You know, you hear these national stories that is becoming more difficult. I don't know what your local experience is, but uh, is there a point at which so many people are voting by mail and voting early that uh, there's decline in the polling place that might cause you to recommend that we, uh, as a economic measure, look at reducing the number of polling locations? Well, that's interesting. I have, I've never calculated that, but that is a thought. Um, see, the thing is, is that it's different for town elections and it's, it, than state elections. So I think we would always, yeah, Lynn's nodding her head. We would always have the quantity of people coming out, the numbers on state elections where we would need this, the polls to be in the numbers that they are now. Whereas we may, we don't necessarily need that for town elections. Um, I mean, we, we obviously can't reduce the number of precincts, but um, if we were to combine a couple of precincts in a couple of locations where we could reduce staff, election worker staff, that would reduce some of the costs. Yeah, I can, I can, I can do an analysis on that and see what the breaking point is. That's very interesting. Yeah, no, but uh, what you said about the uh, elections that have the larger turnout is definitely something to be considered. But I'll let go to Lynn and Bob who have their hands up. Yeah, national elections are even bigger than state. And yeah, I'm, I'm co combining them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I just want to caution how fast we move into something like this. I think it's good to look at the research, but uh, Kathy can chime in on this. Uh, when we looked at potentially having everybody go to the high school, we ran into a buzzsaw and it, and, and frankly, the research didn't support that. People identify with where they vote. And um, so it, they might, we might be able to show that it could save some money, but the education related to it needs to be um, really thought about. I, and um, I, I could go on and say more, but that's all. Um, yeah, I, I, maybe I'm I'm a, a little radical thinking here, but um, I would be interested in looking at um, just entirely mail-in ballots for all for all you know all elections. Um, I, I think that uh, when I look at the local the turnout for local elections, um, I it, it concerns me that people aren't really paying attention to local elections. And maybe we wouldn't get people returning their ballots. I don't know. And, and maybe this isn't the time to, to be thinking about it, but um, I, I, I'm somebody who really thinks that uh, it'd be great if we got 70, 80% voter turnout for every election. Um, and when I see you know some of these numbers here, 13%, 14%, that's it's not really representative of the, the residents of the town. So. Anyway, if we had just vote by mail, I understand that you'd have to hire election workers, but we have to, you know, basically have all this infrastructure around, uh, you know, the, the voting locations. So uh, maybe in the long run, it's it's cheaper. I don't know. Can I speak to that? Sure. Yeah. So we have to follow state law. It comes down to um, what state law tells us we need to do. I love that idea. Um, I think, you know, maybe we'll move towards that someday, but we are we don't have the liberty to make our own rules. Yeah. And the rules require that we provide a polling place. Mm -hmm. I'll also just say, and again, I looked at Kathy on this, but in the various times that we went out for to inform people about the school project, and then my subsequent conversations with constituents and so forth. There's a real trend among older people of wanting to deliver their ballot personally, either go to the poll or drop it off downtown or go in for early voting. And I, frankly, that is our, con that's our consistent vote population is mm -hmm. older people. So mm -hmm. this may just not be something that's arrived yet. It, and since it's not allowed by state law, 
then I think we're not there. Jesse? Yeah, I was just going to say what Stu, Sue might be able to tell us is 1,500 people asked for mail ballots. Do we know how many actually return them? You know, so so you got that opportunity when you said how many people live in your household? Would you like a ballot by mail? Um, our own experience, not this time because we voted in person early, um, but uh, we requested a mail ballot and it never arrived. And the seriously bizarre thing was six months, four months later, my husband's ballot arrived to someone who lived on another street who happened to know us. Um, so it, there was some major glitch in the system because they had our address correct, but it never got to us. So we had to sign an affidavit that we weren't going to vote twice because we just never received it. So I don't know what that was, Bob, but it was that first time we could do it. Um, so I just think the um, Lynn, what Lynn and I encountered and people said, I requested my mail ballot, but I have a different address now because I moved yesterday, but I know where my polling place is. And, you know, they, the comfort level was, I'm going to go somewhere to try to vote um, to make sure they could vote um, because their address changed, you know, two months ago within Amherst. Um, you know, they, yeah. and these were older people who moved from a home into a different place. So anyway. Yeah, no, I, I yeah. understand that's, a, that's always an issue. People will move, you know, two weeks before. Uh, election time. And I, I recognize that. But other states do this, have done it for years. And I think, you know, it would be instructive, you know, to if if we wanted to pursue this, it'd be instructive to look at other states and see how they implemented it in the early years. Yep. Andy, maybe one more question on this. And then Sorry. I'm just looking, yeah. I'll just look at the time. I want to make sure um, we still have two um, full departments and then a few little ones at the end. But um, Barney, you had your hand up. Yeah, I'll, I'll let it go. I, I'm looking at the, the clock here in the lower okay. corner of the screen, and we are running. Okay, and if, there, again, if there's anything anyone isn't really wants to just email it to us, and we'll get a, a response and get it back to you all. Um, all right, so I think with that, um, thank you, Sue, for coming and uh, talking to the committee. And again, if anybody has any other questions for Sue, um, email them in, and we'll get them addressed. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. Hi, Sue. Hi. Thank you. So, Sean, you are up next. Um, Sean is our information technology director. Um, you know, kind of keeps the lifeblood of the town humming along. And so I think we have a few questions for you, Sean. Let me just pull up my list. Um, yeah, so, Sean, what is the plan to install Wi-Fi in the parks and recreation areas? Will this be phased? Um, and which ones have it now? So I'll start with the last part of the question. None of them have it now. Um, but the good news is it's relatively easy to do. So after we complete the downtown Wi-Fi, um, now that we have fiber to a lot of our recreation areas, we'll be able to do uh, Wi-Fi, I would expect, um, this summer. We'll be able to do War Memorial Park, Mill River, or sorry, War Memorial Pool, Mill River Pool, Groff Park, and then um, when the bathroom goes in at Kendrick Park, um, Guilford's going to put a spot there in Conduit, and we'll be able to do Wi-Fi at the new playground at Kendrick Park. Yeah, Sean has been sneaky under the radar good at getting grants. And so we have <laughs> um, uh, a grant to help with the downtown Wi-Fi. We have a grant to extend the um, fiber optic network uh, up to the top of uh I always get the wrong president, Matt Lincoln. Lincoln, yep. yep. Um, and <laughs> and then also Sean is utilizing some ARPA funds that were part of that first round um, to expand the the network to some of the recreation areas. Yeah, and it works out well because they're the grants are for Wi-Fi and fiber, and they rely on each other, so it makes, makes it easy to spend the money. Dorothy. Um. Okay. Sean mentioned the bathroom at Kendrick Park. Now, when we were talking about this, it seems like two years ago, um, Kathy had some research that the bathroom would cost a million dollars. Uh, I'm really excited about the thought of a bathroom at Kendrick Park. Are there any details that can be shared at this time? So, Paul, do you want to take this one? So, so 
<laughs> so DPW is handling this. We we haven't gone out to bid, I don't think, for it, uh, but we're looking at the what they call the Portland Loo type. That's a prefab thing that um, the space is already outfitted to allow for the installation of it. Uh, when they built Kendrick Park, they had envisioned having a bathroom there. So that's all set, ready to go. It's just a matter of getting it out to bid. There's a lot of things on DPW's plates right now, but this is one of the, it's not a million dollars, so. No, we allocated um, is either two hundred or maybe two fifty. I think two fifty yeah. from the American Rescue Plan Act um, oh. for this. So yeah, it's um, it's a priority that DPW is working on. So is this is this a self clean one? I'm curious about, or does it? We'll have to clean that. They're not very few of them really actually work. The self cleaning ones. You know, I suspected that. Okay, so this is a perfect use of ARPA funds. So thank you very much. And we haven't settled on the Portland Lou. Some of us have different. Right. We have to go out. To, so I'm sorry. Oh, we have to go out to bid. And... Some people really like the aesthetics of the Portland Lou, and others do not. So yeah, that's good. you have fast Wi-Fi while you're using it, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right. Next question. Uh, can um, I assume this means um, maybe free internet? Can we provide or access to the network can we provide to low-income housing or um, public housing wi-fi or internet access yeah we can it, it gets a little more complicated so um, wi-fi is easy to do anywhere we have um, something to mount the equipment to um, especially if it's something we own and we have fiber going to there or a way of getting a wireless link to there so downtown's easy the recreation areas are easy. Um, doing outdoor areas are much easier. Once you start talking about um, providing Wi-Fi inside of buildings um, and inside of buildings that the town doesn't own, um, it gets a lot more complicated. So um, if we had specific places we were interested in, we, we absolutely could look into it. Um, but just putting something outside of a building um, won't necessarily penetrate the building that well. We ran into this. Um, we had an antenna on the rooftop of the bank center providing um, providing Wi-Fi to drawing yeah, blank in Wayland. Yeah, um, yeah, and what we found is that everybody on the the south side of the building got internet access, but once you went over, across the hallway to the north side of the building, we weren't providing internet access on that side. So it came, um, I, people people were upset about that. So, but, so again, it, it gets tricky. It's something it's something we'd be happy to look into um, and get a, a price on what would be involved, but it it can get complicated. Kathy. Um, Sean, I, if if we don't have an internal budget for it, um, with the places we don't, uh, as you said, we have places we own is a little bit easier. Um, do you know whether uh, C, CPAC money could be used and call it an upgrade of places we funded in the past that are um, affordable units? So I, I'm just thinking that the Comcast rates have gone up a lot, and it's it's um, for so it's a, it's just a question on whether there is some access to a support system if we can get the technical part right but money is the object do we know whether community preservation act money could be used that way so it may not be a question that needs to be answered now yeah. <laughs> so, but but i i was going to say you know it you're recreate you're creating utility at this point in time because you you can't just provide the signal you also have to support the signal when people have complaints you know, if your people become dependent on it, you really have to have utility and staffing to support it. If, because, you know, it is a utility now for folks and it's something you can't live without. And we discovered that during COVID. So uh, yeah. if we want to go down that road, we really need to do, develop a pretty robust proposal for how to provide that if we're going to do that for um, private private properties. Yeah, I think it's, I, I do think it's a bigger issue. There was a group here talking about that. There's there was a group in Northampton talking about it. So mm -hmm. And to your question about CPA, I would have to look into that closer. I don't know if, um, like, to in an existing um, facility, I don't know if, if just buying Wi-Fi or um, the access would be allowable. And I don't, it doesn't seem like it would be, but we, we can double check. Dorothy? Um, I personally think that um, 
finding some way to do this thing, which is clearly much more complicated than we were thinking, would be one of the best social justice projects that we could do in the town. Um, before COVID, we there were a number of events held around town with the community outreach officers, and I went to a, a number of them. And one of them uh, outside the big apartments on East Hadley Road, people kept coming up and saying the same thing. We don't have internet. And I thought, wow, the town is putting all this effort and making all kinds of ways to communicate with people. And yet huge segments of people can't communicate with the town since we're doing everything um, by on internet. And I remember a student who was in my grandson's class in, um, in uh, grammar school um, lived a little bit further north and she and her mother had to go sit in a car in a parking lot outside some public building at night in order for her to do her homework and for her to get the signal. So I, I just think this would be the, the best social justice thing we could do uh, is to make sure that everybody had access and their children had access to, to the internet. So. Yeah, um, again, to Paul's point, it's a large project, but it's something I think, Sean, you said when the net, INET was being put up that you know it was being structured in a way for possible um, down the road. I will say just in terms of students, um, I know the library and the schools, they they do have hot spot devices um, that they loan out that have um, internet access. Um, and I don't know if there's any restrictions on where they have internet access, but they, um, for the reason you described that they loan those out, but it doesn't address the larger issue that you described. Um, and then the last question, and Brianna, you may want to weigh in on this one um the website are there any issues with the website and have you received any public feedback I'm happy to hop in on that um, hi everybody i'm brianna center communications director so we have not had major issues um the thing that's constantly ongoing is working with departments to make sure that their content is up to date and accurate since we have almost 2000 uh, web pages give or take and last fiscal year we had about 1.5 million visits to our um, official website so it just shows that over over time the traffic has gotten considerable um, big increases a lot of that can be contributed to a combination of covid um, moving more services online for digital delivery and through um, our kind of solid communication strategy that constantly funnels people back to our site from our other marketing and outreach on social media and otherwise um so for, regarding feedback we have a feedback button that is on every single one of our um 2000 plus web pages right at the bottom website feedback um we in the last 90 days got seven submittals most often they are not broad based but um, reporting a broken link on a page or um, suggesting that something is missing from uh, usually a department page so we do have a mechanism for anytime feedback from people who are on our site and the other piece that we would be looking to do the next time we go into um, optimizing or updating the website redesigning it is working with and creating a small group of potentially community members who could advise us on their user experiences and needs um, that's something that didn't happen the last time because we were in the middle of COVID when we uh, did the last update so we'd be looking to do that the next time that we um, made enhancements I'm happy to answer any other questions, but did that cover Matt? Uh, actually, it's not a question, Brianna. I just want to thank you. You've been really great with um, some of the communications, press release type things that we've done. But um, uh, Andy, I do have to leave at three. I apologize. Okay, well, thank you. Kathy? Mine is just a comment, Brianna. I think you've been amazing. Um, it, and amazing and your whole team with Sean too you're very responsive so the building committee the elementary school as we um, uh, morphed into multiple subcommittees suddenly we've got web website a place to put everything and it was such quick turnaround and you, you work with different staff um, and they said you know Brianna showed me how to do this um, so just thank you th and then updating our outside web page it was just um, you probably don't get patted on the back often enough, but you should. It's fantastic. Thank you, Councillor Shane. Any other questions for um, information technology? 
I will say um, one of our costs that has almost become like utilities and Sean knows this is um, our software costs. Uh, we become so dependent on software and you know, it's it's just hard to ever transition away from some of our softwares that um, you know we're sort of become bound to these annual increases which seem like they just go up five percent a year regardless mm -hmm. um, I know Munis is the one I use it's an expensive one our, our whole accounting system is Munis um, and we asked our rep this just on Wednesday like why does it go up every five percent every year like you're not adding you know new features like that kind of stuff it's just um so but it is just one of those uh steady consistent cost drivers that we see every year and um and it's a pretty large budget overall for software when you look at all the different departments it all comes out of sean's it budget so it's all managed in one place and we look at it and that's one of the areas one of the first things we do with the budget every year as we review the software lists for sort of creep and there's it's easy for there to be creep with software um and sometimes this comes from um, maybe council requests or public requests or various entities wanting to see different types of information. And, you know, there's almost always a software that can do it, but it comes down to, you know, is it worth it? And, and do we want to pay the annual fee? Everything is um, uh, uh, software as a service nowadays. So if you don't pay the annual fee, you don't get the access to the software. Um, so we do review that every year. All right. Thank you, Sean. Okay. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, Brianna. Um, all right. So next up is Jeremiah, who's in the council, of the, the backup room there behind the council. Is that where you are? It looks I like he's it. in a cathedral. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um. Yes. Yes. I, I am in the back room of the town meeting room. <laughs> Um, so I've got a few questions. Uh, for, so Jeremiah man, is our facilities manager, um, really is in charge of the day to day with everything with our facilities and does a good job um, uh, keeping things running. So the first question, Jeremiah. Um, Poorly written. Yeah, no, I'm just, sorry, I'm just trying to, um, I think this so related to um, Related to the capital uh, facility funds, um, sort of the bucket for maintenance or not maintenance, but sort of the smaller capital type um, improvements. Um, how has that been working to have sort of one pool to address multiple types of projects? It, I think it's been working very well uh, to have that one sort of big bucket uh, to take care of. Uh, what it's allowed me to do is when I'm approaching maybe one capital project, and in, in doing so, I see that there, there could be other work that's done, or we might be able to do other work uh, cheaper because, may, say, the walls are open, that, that I take care of it at that same time. So um, we, we have these, you know, this, these uh, projects that have come, and we see them on our, our larger 10-year capital plan, but I can piggyback off of those. Um, with that, those fund that funding, uh, it's also helped for uh, some increases. And then, unfortunately, like like uh, Sean Sean has mentioned, you know, we're seeing a lot of increases uh, in in costs uh, for for buildings. So, projects, some projects that that were ten or fifteen thousand dollars, you know, five years ago are sixty now. So, mm -hmm. try to account for them as best as possible. Thank you. Um, can you speak a little bit to um, how you coordinate with uh, facility staff at the schools like Rupert and how you coordinate with um, sustainability director uh, Stephanie Ciccarello? Yeah, so as far as uh, working with Stephanie, I, our our desks are right next to one another. Um, so we we are collaborating and communicating uh, almost daily when we're with each other. And, and you know, we we come together. Um, I, I'll have questions for her. She has questions for me. And so I think right there we have we have a good rapport and that that sort of close relationship. As far as the schools, there is a number of facilities uh, items that do overlap. And when we do have that overlap, I'm reaching out to Ben, I'm reaching out to Rupert. And, and then we have those uh, collaborative and sort of collective conversations and try to figure out you know how, how best approach it 
I, I would say one of the, the particulars that, that we tend to collaborate a lot with is elections. Um, you know, that's where we, we really come together. But has there been other uh, collaboration beyond that, just regular facilities? Absolutely. And, I, and then that's, that's a relationship that will continue to grow and I'll continue to foster. Thank you. Okay. Um, so go ahead, Kathy. So Sean, when I sent these in, somehow my hands typed a whole section on the page 111 on some of the utility bills. Yeah, and I was going to go to those next, but if okay. so, I was just going to let you know it's in the wrong place. It, it was yeah, it was yeah, I, I figured it out. But thank you, thank you. Um, all right, so yeah, so we're going to go to that section now, Kathy. So uh, utility use. Um, on the on the facility department page, there's a, a chart that shows the trend in electricity use, um, and it kind of goes down and then comes back up. Um, Jeremiah, feel free to weigh in, but from where I you know, sort of our my end of it, when we look at bills, uh, it seems like it sort of trends with the pandemic, which makes sense intuitively to us. Um, it drops off for FY20 and FY21, and then. Uh, comes back up for FY22. And one, I'll give you one sort of specific example. The Musanti Health Center wasn't operating very much at all uh, during the pandemic. Um, and now they're back in full force. And and we've seen electricity go up at the bank center. We've also seen the water. There's a question water. about water use yes. going up. Um, and we think yeah. specifically the water is a big one there um, as well. And then we, and again, we collect, that's one of the reasons why we collect a, an annual rent payment um, yeah. to offset that. Yeah, it, it electric. Uh, the electricity is a tough one. I mean, we're always making or taking me measures to you uh, reduce our usage say, with lighting projects and such. But we're we're ta we're taking those measures. It, but we also have uh, a electrical infrastructure that's also starting to age. So as as equipment gets older, as motors get older the demand for electricity, their usage is going to increase. And it's, it's very small amounts, but it's, it's, it almost, it, it almost just keeps the, the scales in balance in a way of that upward, uh, slight up, upward and trade unless, unless like very large changes are made where we're still, we should see that, that upward trend what I'd like to try to do is stabilize it so we don't have these huge spikes. One of the big spikes, like like Sean had mentioned, is water. Water was that was a, that was a big one. Yeah, that that went from you know it, it probably increased two to three hundred percent, I would say. Um, and so that one was a little bit of an alarming. Say what what is causing this? And and really, it was a good service. We're we're all of those dental services and uh, um, uh, the health services that are in that Musanti space is is the driver, and that's that's a good thing. Yeah, you know, I have that. Jeremiah, can you list off a few of the um, locations where you're currently either planning or actively working on um, uh, HVAC project that will increase efficiency? Yeah, so two right now at, at uh, the Amherst Police Department. One is to replace an aged um, uh, uh, cooling system, and that's for their telecommunication rooms. Um, that That is just about ready to go out to bid. Um, another is we just contracted with uh, mechanical engineers, some designers to help us with the chiller replacement over at APD and that chiller hopefully will be a heat pump chiller uh, so that that will provide heating on all those swing seasons and when when it's a little bit mild outside but also the cooling so that we're burning much much less fossil fuels. Um, we also uh, had the UMass students uh, do an assessment of the town hall building and I got to uh, sit sit through their presentation on Tuesday of this week and, and hear how they, uh, what they proposed for the town, uh, for town hall to electrify our heating system here and get off of fossil fuels. So I would say those three are probably the ones that are 
closest in my sights. And the next one would be uh, the Munson Memorial Library. Jeremiah, in terms of our electricity consumption, um, as we move systems off of natural gas or heating oil and onto elect, you know, fully electric systems, do you expect our electricity consumption to rise or you know, will these new systems be so much more efficient even with their electricity use that we won't notice an impact? Yes, absolutely. They are going to arise. Okay. Um, so s some of these have some type of electrical uh, uh, resistors in them that might be generating heat. Stuff like that will drive drive up that that uh, electrical usage. Um, we have to understand those where we might be. Um, we're, we'll be saving money on uh, fossil fuel side. So either on gas or 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 the um, home heating fuels, the number two oil. We're, we're eliminating that piece. So really those kind of funds would transfer over to electric. Yeah, I think that's an important point that to caution that when we do this, we might not necessarily see the savings and we'll just transition to a different bucket because electricity yeah. prices have gone up as you all know, as fast as anything has gone up. Yeah. Um, and, and our electricity in this area is driven by natural gas. So, um, or, you know, produced largely with natural gas. Um, so, it's not going to necessarily be a cost saver as we do this, but obviously it's consistent with the town's goals. Right. But, but we'll get, we'll get, we will get there though. I mean, with all of the work that's being done and, and all of the assessments that we're doing with solar and solar projects and those solar arrays, that's how we offset the, yeah. the increases in electric. Kathy. That was going to be my question on, we've got solar on the landfill and to the extent we can be offs offsetting it. Um, and um, it wasn't clear to me the other day, Sean, um, when we were with the elementary school building on sustainability, but I, I think our new building may generate a surplus with the panels. They're, you know, they're not doing it just a very narrow. So. Mm -hmm if we can capture it in other buildings where we generate more renewable that we actually use, um, you know, so what, 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 when, when we start to look at other buildings, we should be thinking that way. If we have buildings and parking lots, that it's a pooled resource. Um, so. Kathy, are, are you offering to explain to this group what a Teddy is? No, okay. no. Uh. no, there's a whole new, there's a whole new uh, state, um, state building code that okay. completely affects our building um and it it changes the names of everything so <laughs> it's it's got a new acronym but it will increase the cost of the envelope of the building and yeah. i think this is coming in for private buildings as well it's not just it's not just public buildings so the um the first reaction to this jeremiah just so you know was a gasp of the energy model because we could not achieve their ta targets yeah. so they had to change they had to change their code because yeah. you know uh, yeah so it's 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 not a small change it's a big change yeah C kathy to your point though um on solar so we have few if any behind the meter solar systems where you really get the benefit of solar again we have like the, the landfill is great but it's a an off taker you know type arrangement where you know we send the the money back to the grid and then we get a credit which is not as financially advantageous as if we actually have the solar mounted on a building and feeding the electricity um directly so i think that's the area we've got to look to expand in the future and we had that study done of municipal facilities so we've got the data um but I think that's our next step is to look at more of the behind the meter type systems that's actually power in the building. Lynn? And the irony is that the highest production is going to be when school's not in session. Because the summer over the, month. Over the summer, yeah. Yeah, yeah right. no, the, so the schools it, were the best. The schools big, were the, um, the big, uh, yeah. from a return on investment, those were the, the high school and middle school were the best locations that's when my my electric bill goes to zero in the summer well then but the school because we're going to own them rather than having to do it through a third party we'll be accumulating that um whatever we call it behind but we you know the way our house works um you know we yeah, you can pass those credits on i think you can transfer those types of credits and those might be a little more advantageous right. than to, one, to a building that's being more used that yep. maybe the air conditioning's on in the summer or something just right um i think that or no, there's might be a couple other questions here um 
We talked about water. Uh, do we offset electric use costs with landfill solar fields production? And again, we do, um, but it's um, it's not a direct uh, offset. It's uh, we get a penny a penny savings per kilowatt hour essentially is what we get on the electricity billing side. Um, and again, there were other financial benefits that we discussed uh, during the enterprise fund piece of it, but in terms of the electric electric costs, it's a penny savings per kilowatt hour, um, which is about thirty thousand dollars a year or so. Um, and is there a table with costs for line items on page 11, electric, gas, oil, water, sewer? Um, Kathy, do you know? Yeah, well, so on page 111, it showed the kilowatt hours and the gallons, but I didn't know whether we had something that said these kilowatt hours translate to this amount of dollars. Um, Just like a total budget for electricity? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we could we could provide that. Yeah, we can add and, that. And up. I know you did it in JCPC, but I was just you know that um, so it bounces around. But meanwhile, the price for those has been going up. So just so yeah, no, that's that's a huge one of the areas that we've seen grow grow tremendously in this past year, especially as the rates went up over the winter, um, and we're hoping to actually potentially lock in rates now to bring it back down because um, rates are actually. They've sort of dropped back off a little bit um, since the winter. And then, if Musanti is a major source, if water went from thirty-one thousand cubic feet to ninety-five, so Jeremiah, you already said it tripled. But um, do we charge Musanti for the water use? Does that become a bill or part of their rent? Uh, I don't believe they pay for it separately. It's um, it's one of the things they pay rent for. But is the rent adjusted to reflect the fact that there's an our annual, water rate, you know, our, does, water rate, our water rates are going up and yeah. if you're a home, you and you you tripled your water use, you would see it in a bill. Um, yeah, so their rate, you know, the history was, you know, they had sort of a lower rate as they were kind of getting started and then it's escalated up um, to be more in line with sort of market rates in the area. Um, and it does have an annual increase of two and a half or three percent that it goes up every year. Um, and it's a license agreement, so we can adjust it um, annually as needed. Okay, thanks. All right, I think that's it for facilities. Any other facility questions? Oh, I, there's one more actually. Um, and Jeremiah, we talked about this a little bit. Is there a facilities management plan in place? Yeah, so all life safety equipment or systems ha have contracted services just to ensure that they meet regulatory standard. Uh, beyond that, I've developed uh, uh, and continue to develop uh, facilities preventive maintenance programs. Um, this is done through like policies and procedures, uh, checklists, a checklist that it includes uh, supplies, tools, and all of these uh, items like that. So, so uh, staff can look at them. They'll come up I'm in my tasks. So, I, I I use our Outlook and the the software that that uh, IT provides, um, and you, we get those we get those uh, tasks that those reminders those come up. We uh, couple that with uh, a checklist, and then we take care of those particular uh, preventive maintenance uh, items. So we do. Thank you. Any final questions for facilities? Good, all right, you're off the hook, Jeremiah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. All right, so we have a few more um, sections, but they're not really departments, so I'll just, run through them quickly. So um, we have the employee benefit section, which we touched on um, a little bit. So we break out all our health insurance benefits, uh, life insurance, that kind of thing. Um, the other thing that's in that section is, um, is our contingency for the outcome of collective bargaining. bargaining. Um, and right now there is some money in there because we have a few unsettled uh, we have some unsettled contracts. So just note that this, there isn't always money in there for that, but when we have a year like this where we're between contracts, um, we do budget that money there. All right, and then there was a question, health insurance projected increase by 8% in FY24, um, but let me just go to 
Yeah, it was just that was mine when I looked at the yeah why it's only a one and a half percent increase the, the total only went up by a certain amount but the projection was a lot more I just and then I thought yeah. well maybe it's because there was a shift in the composition of the contracts but when I looked at the contracts it didn't look you know like is there more family contracts and I didn't see it so I just did it was just purely I didn't understand the math yeah um, so so the eight percent that's only for active health insurance. So that's one thing. It's not all health insurances. So like I was saying for retiree, um, those increases have been much less and uh, it's a little bit, uh, uh, the timing is a little bit different for retiree health insurance versus active. So active out goes by a fiscal year. Our retiree, because it's Medicare, it goes by a calendar year. Um, but we know for the calendar year, uh, 2023, um, through December, we know our Medicare rates. And so we only really have to project an increase for half the year each year. Um, so, but those Medicare rates have been very advantageous. And then I'm just, I think I know the answer to the other piece. Sorry, I didn't get to this before the meeting. Um, I think the other reason why it didn't go up as much is because we aren't budgeting as much of a uh, contingency because we have some of our contracts settled for next year. Okay. But let me just confirm that real quick. You know, it's if it's just a math issue, I just didn't understand how it. Why it's not going up eight percent or. or up. And the no, other I, thing we, I was the other perfectly thing we, happy with one point five percent. I mean, <laughs> I didn't have a quibble with it. The other thing we do is we do adjust our um, health insurance enrollment each year, so it, it could be sometimes if there's fewer plans, that helps um, alleviate some of that. Uh, right. on, it's, it's kind of a techie question, Sean. So we don't need to take everyone's time. No, yeah. right. those are my favorite questions. Um, yeah, the big, I think one of the, <laughs> I think the, our content budgetary control, again, which is used for um, the outcome negotiations is about half as much as it was in FY23 and, and we have about half as many open contracts. So um, so that's the, why it, that went down, which offset some of the health insurance increase. Okay. Um, we talked about, can we show uh, benefits sort of, uh, by department or by operating budget, but all in one place. And yeah, we'll we'll get something together for that uh, before next year. Um, yeah, and there was another question about health insurance being separate from pensions. And again, that, that's just a structural decision that was made a while ago. Um, it's helpful to operating budgets because they don't have to absorb the, I think I'm assuming one of the reasons why it was done is because pensions had a pretty large annual increase. and. Um, trying to help the operating budget not have to absorb that each year, but, um, and there were a few more, let's see. Yeah, I, I think you answered most that, of them. Is that all of them? Okay. Yeah, no, and it's just, it's the same good thing that Bob said, you know, that where's pensions and then you leaf through and you can find pensions someplace and where's right. health insurance and go, these are pretty big numbers. And if, if we've been looking at, to, if we've been looking at the whole school budget without them, <laughs> There's right. a big piece missing each right. time. And when you do get, you know, when we look at state reports for per people spending and things like that, all that does get rolled in to that number. So um, the per people spending numbers for the schools, we, we give them a pension number um, every year that reflects their their share. So that number is an all in number. Mm -hmm. um, so the only other thing I'll just say, just so uh, you guys can say you just reviewed every department. Um, the other couple areas were uh, general services. So general services is the section of our budget that manages our legal services, our audit fees, our um, OPEB actuarial fees. And then it does, um, it also is where we pay some of our like across the board, like copier, printer type things that help all departments. And then the last one, I think it's the last one, is the... Um, I'm scrolling through our budget. Oh, the other assessments in OPEB. Um, so again, that's where state assessments, uh, where we, we show our state assessments, where OPEB contributions are. That section, it's page 204 is where it starts. That's where you can see the, the pension uh, number, um, our OPEB contribution number, and then any of our state assessments. I think that's, and then there is a debt and interest section as well. Um, the section before that, we, we show you what we're budgeting for debt payments for the upcoming year from the general fund. I think that's it. Any questions on any of those sections? 
Yes, I had one, and that is uh, we used to have the legal services in a separate section altogether, which then gave the ability to track annually whether there were shifts and how big the shifts were in that particular line item when you and uh, are there any trends in that that are now hidden from us because of the, it's lumped in with the larger not saying that they're hidden from us but they're not reported to us yeah um well not hidden but i'm just looking at so there's a couple different areas where legal services show up so human resources they show up um it's largely to support collective bargaining and so we expect the pat the, um this year and the, um, until negotiations are settled that we'll see a little bit higher costs in those areas and again that'll be when when we have ongoing negotiations they'll go up a little bit and when we have settled contracts they'll come back down um, and then the more general um, legal line let me just take a look at the spreadsheet here Um, yeah, so I think maybe, um, they've, you know, they went up in FY22. We had some different legal issues going on in FY22, um, some of which you probably all remember, um, related to the library project. Um, and there's been other things that's been used for. Um, so I think the best way, Andy, to address, you know, your question is, you know, we can probably give a, Paul can do some sort of annual update or something that describes sort of the trend over time. Um, I know that's always a question is sort of use of legal services. So um, the good news is, you know, at least my experience, it's not, I haven't had experience with many different places, but relative to the schools is that the town has a pretty preferential um, rate with KP law. The rate's been much lower than what I've seen in other places. Um, and, you know, they don't, we have this uh, retainer agreement where, you know, they don't kind of nickel and dime you for everything you send to them, which is nice as well. Yeah, I think about it because when we had a conversation earlier in the day about um, the council being conscious of things mm -hmm. that they are doing and asking for and uh, recognizing that the financial consequences, uh, and this is another area that can have that overflow and I um uh, because we don't show it, it doesn't make uh, our counselors uh, as conscious of it. Yeah, that's that's why it might be good to have an annual. So just for your information, so in FY20, we spent 54000 In FY21, we spent 67000 Our budget has been about 100000 110000 for those years. So those years were low years, but in FY22, it went up to 158000 um, So FY22, again, was a high year. Um, and then we'll see this uh, in the 23. I can give an update on this in the third quarter report where it's at for this year. Okay. So um, there seems to have been a uh, failure in our uh, planning mechanism because I guess we don't have C and D today. Yeah, no, I don't know why they got at it today. It must, it must have been miscommunication. They, um, they were planned for Tuesday um because i didn't think that we would have time to get to them today it's been on the uh, consolidated planning calendar that way to the, today for a long time and it just got missed between all of us that there was this disconnect the important thing is that athena's not here and we made we need to make sure that the uh Posting is correct. Yeah, I emailed Athena before this meeting because I, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, it was, must have been my, I must not have been comparing my version to your version um, because I was always planning on C and D going next Tuesday um, or the, this coming Tuesday. So I think it was just my error not uh, updating you on that. But Dave and his group, they, they're planning on Tuesday and I let Athena know. So she's updated the um, posting. So she has the posting correct for Tuesday. I'll check and see if she's made the update, but I emailed her before the meeting. If not, um, as soon as you get off, because uh, I can check it right now and just see if it's been updated yet. But yeah, so Tuesday will be uh, planning, conservation, uh, which will include sustainability, 
and um, inspections, and then we'll also have fire EMS and uh, public health. And you've looked at the actual, uh, one of us needs to look at the actual posting because there's, we're, we're talking about uh, hours really before she would have to get that corrected if it's not posted correctly. Yeah, hold on, I'm just pulling it up right now. Um, yep, she's updated it. So it's public health, fire EMS, okay. and um, conservation development. Good. Sorry to bore everybody with this detail, except I had to. And Bernie, I think I know what you're going to ask, but uh, go ahead. <laughs> I'm not going to ask anything. I, uh, I I need to. Uh, I need my apologies to everyone. I need to leave. I've um, got another appointment coming up. So. Yeah. Well, we're about to. Um, Adjourn the question that you had asked me in an email during the meeting. I do think we need to straighten out too, which is to make sure that we have, because I had sent out way at the beginning a list of departments and make sure that everybody's got the right departments. I'll just resend that. Yeah, I haven't received any questions for conservation and development. So um, I don't know who offhand was assigned there, but. Oh, thank, thank you all. Um, we'll see you on. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I won't do it in an open meeting, but I think there may have been some confusion. Okay. Um, so, um, does anybody have anything else that they want to raise is some recognized, um, unanticipated business? Cause I, uh, otherwise I'm just going to come in the next meetings a little bit and then adjourn and uh i'm going to try and see what we can do to get caught up on a bunch of minutes for tuesday's meeting but make them go quick so that if i come up with any changes i'll send send them in advance uh and was working with being a little bit on seeing if we could catch up with some more minutes and uh the report piece uh as you're going through your sections, and I'll make this a part of the memo that I'm sending out on the reminders to who is in what section uh, to get straight out the, the problem that may exist, uh, that uh, to start thinking about what to say for, for the department that you were assigned to. And uh, then uh, also, if you think that there's an issue that's going to be a particular discussion item for the committee to flag it, I think we'll all do that. But uh, there was one that uh, certainly came up today, and there's one that I've been working on. One that came up a little bit today was when we got somebody again mentioned the whole thing with the police budget and press, and uh, you know that needs. I think that will be one we'll have to spend some time out on when we get into the summation meeting. And the other one that I have been working on because I'm assigned to elementary schools is uh, I've done some um, analysis and numbers on the question of uh, the $84,000 that the uh, school department asked for that's above what the amount allocated um, in the budget that was proposed by Paul. And uh, that's certainly going to be an issue that we will need to talk about as a separate issue. Um, what we did last year, and I think we'll get to again this year, is um, generally recognize that we're, recognize, we're recommending all the departments, and, um, but that we're identifying the ones we want to talk about separately, so it's sort of handled as a, uh, uh, trying to identify the ones that need separate discussion so that everything else gets encompassed in a single motion. Uh, Kathy. Yeah, I see, I'm just looking at your list. I see that I saw May 19th and thought I was general government and it was Bernie. So I've got conservation planning and inspections and I will get, 
whatever questions I have. I'll get them to you by Monday morning, maybe over the weekend. I know you've been holding your breath. So I just saw May 19th and went for it. But got them. We'll do them. General and, government got double duty this year. That's okay. No, and I'll try to be a little bit more coherent than some of my general government. <laughs> Don't worry about it. It's we, like you had a couple other things on your plate, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> So with that said, I don't think that there's anything else for today. I want the minutes to note, so I'll say it out loud so, so it gets picked up, that um, I've been checking it several times to make sure that um, there's no one from the general public who's been here. And, um, I, and I did not call for public comment, not because I didn't think public comment's important, I absolutely do, but there was no public to invite to make comment. So that should be noted in the minutes when we get there. Anything else? If not, I think we're adjourned. Hi, everyone. Have Bye. a happy weekend. Council's adjourned, too. <laughs>